It may be mid-November, the heating is well and truly on, and for some people even talking about the C-word is now allowed. But what might be strange, for generally a summer sport, athletics is still very much in focus, and British athletics has once again been the hot topic. The brilliant British para-athletics team who managed to beat the heat in Dubai, finishing third in the medal table with 13 golds and 29 medals at the World Athletics Championships. And the leading British athletes hoping to compete for Team GB in Tokyo next summer, turning up the heat on the British Olympic Association, saying they'll take them to court over what they call ridiculous sponsorship restrictions. Will it reach critical boiling point? We'll discuss. I'm John. And I'm Michael. And all the week's news, views and talking points. And John has summarised some of them there from the world of Olympic and Paralympic sport. Once again, we aim to bring you the widest cross section of sports and on the agenda in this episode of Anything But Footy. Tennis, badminton, fencing, cycling, table tennis, curling, swimming and more. We'd love to hear from you, of course. You can go to our website. That's anythingbutfooty.com. You can email us, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. You can tweet us at anythingbutf. And you can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. And you can download and listen to our podcast via Apple and Google Podcasts. We're on Spotify. And we'd ask you to rate us nicely if you like. And we'd ask you to comment on us as well. This is Anything But Footy, your unashamedly Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast. Yeah, and on that, thanks and hello to all our new listeners, downloaders, podcast fans, whatever you're called. We're glad you're with us and on track for Tokyo 2020. We've had more than a thousand downloads in the last month alone. So thank you and welcome. And there are now sponsorship opportunities available on anything but footy. If you're a small company or business, a small investor or a company looking for some low cost commercial opportunities, please get in touch. Check out our website, anythingbutfooty.com anythingbutfooty.com. That's the hard sell. On to the action. <laughs> and Great Britain ended the World Para Athletics Championships in third place in the table with 29 medals, including 13 golds, won by 10 athletes, nine silvers and six bronze. And that's the head of the likes of the USA and Ukraine. But China and Brazil were first and second, with the South Americans recording their best ever World Championship performance. Legacy from 2016, maybe. Well, job done and on track for Tokyo, a according to head coach of Paralympic world-class programme, Paula Dunn, who spoke to journalists in Dubai afterwards. I actually feel really, really well. Um, lots of PBs, lots of season bests, um, three world records. Um, for a championships in November, I, I'm walking away really happy with that and all the performances of the athletes. You know, obviously there's a couple of athletes that are going to be disappointed, but generally the field has been really, really positive in the camp. So the official target for UK sport was 24 to 28 medals in Tokyo events. So we got 29 in total and 23 in the Tokyo events. But obviously we are missing quite a few of our uh, big athletes. Um, so I actually think um, on, on paper we are doing really, really well. There's no Johnny Peacock, there's no uh, Steph Reed. There's no Georgina Hermitage, there's no Dan Green. So no, I'm a uh, really, really good place. Paula Dunn, the head of Paralympic world-class programme for British athletics and making the point there, no Johnny Peacock, no Steph Reed, no Dan Greaves and, you know, on track for Tokyo with that 29 medals target. But there were some great new names in there, some different names, but also some world-class athletes, Michael, uh, performing for Great Britain. Yeah, just at a point of detail on that medal table, by the way, we included Derek Ray's T46 Marathon silver medal, uh, which is a world championship medal. So that's why uh, we have included it in the medal table. That was actually won, though, at the London Marathon earlier this year because that's where they had uh, the world championship. So a terrific result, as you say, out in Dubai, 28 medals in in Dubai, so 29 in total. The 13 golds, 9 silvers, 6 bronzes. And I have to say, for me, one of the highlights was the very final night, which was this new race running event that we spoke about on a previous edition of Anything But Footy. This is where the race runner has a, a three-wheel frame to support themselves. And a double gold medal for Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Gavin Drysdale and Kelly Hago adding to that total, uh, which, as I said... Put Great Britain and Northern Ireland and, as John said, third place in the medal table as well. And that, to me, just states the reward for investing properly 
in sport. And I don't just mean, obviously, Olympic sport, but Paralympic sport here as well. You know, the investment over a number of years now into Paralympic sport in this country is paying dividends time after time after time. And this is just the the latest example of it. China expectedly top of that medal table. Brazil, as you quite rightly say there, a result of the legacy from Rio. 14 goals, 9 silvers, 16 bronze. Great result from Brazil. And Great Britain and Northern Ireland ahead of the USA, fourth in the medal table, and the Ukraine. To pick out some of those names, new names as you say, some familiar names as well. A sixth World Championship medal for Richard Whitehead. A silver in the T61 200 metres. Sophie Hahn, she is just an absolute machine. Two world records, <laughs> two golds. In the T38, 100 metres and 200 metres. She, she's effectively Great Britain and Northern Ireland's Usain Bolt, if you like. Just the leading sprinter in her class. And then Hannah Cockcroft as well. 100 metres and 800 metres gold medals in the T34 class. So she now lists 12 World Championship medals. Uh, 20 international medals in total. The Paralympics, the World Championships and the European Championships. And a huge comeback as well for her after what was, by her own high standards, a bit of a dip last year. And that rivalry with Carrie Adenagan, who we spoke to in the build-up to this championship, who won silver in both of those events, that must just be pushing Hannah Cockcroft on you know, to even greater levels of athletic achievement. It was great to see Alan Davis and Holly Arnold showing the strength as well in the throwing events, the shot put and the javelin. But a couple of new names that, that kind of leapt out to me as well. Maria Lyle, she won two golds and this was her third world championships in the T35, 100 metres and 200 metres. She'd previously won loads of silvers and bronze but never got to the top spot. So it was great to see her uh, finally on the, the top podium, if you like. And Sabrina Fortune as well won her first ever world championship gold, throwing a last effort championship record and a huge personal best in the women's shot put F20 final 13.91 meters and the Paralympic bronze medalist at Rio 2016 said I'm over the moon there are no words to describe how amazing that moment was but you mentioned as well slight changing of the guard uh, as well a little bit with 43 year old British captain and double Paralympic champion Richard Whitehead finally being beaten by 17 year old South African and Tando Malangu in the T61 200 meters someone he beat to silver in Rio and London 2017 and why Whitehead admitting afterwards the first 100 metres was fine, the last 100 metres because of a lack of races in my legs wasn't. Hopefully I'll be able to come back next year stronger. I was pleased that it wasn't the end for Richard Whitehead as well. I think he's been a great captain as well for them with Adam Egan, the youngster, and Whitehead with the veteran. Uh, he said he's, you know, he's enjoyed playing his role as a leader, inspiring the youngsters to come through. And also a slight change in the guard, Kadena Cox, we said she was one to watch. Uh, she won silver in the T38 400 metres, uh, admitting after that she hadn't quite focused properly on her race. Yeah, Kadena Cox, um, there's been some very interesting news lines and, and stories, if you like, coming back from Dubai. Silver in that 400 metres, sixth in the 200 metres. And after her races, uh, she told us that the Dubai Championships had actually triggered a relapse in an eating disorder that she has been battling for quite some time. Now, British Athletics have said that they have no regrets in selecting Kadena Cox. And Kadena Cox has actually has said she's had amazing support from the body, the governing body, British Athletics as well. Now, I don't think it's for, for me, and it's certainly not for John and I and anything but footy, to, to second-guess what Kadena Cox's state of mind is. I think what we have to say, though, is that we have to trust the safeguarding measures that are in place to protect and support the athletes. If you've been listening to our spin-off podcast, Great British Bosses, where we've been talking to some of the MDs and the CEOs of British sport, that word safeguarding comes up time after time after time. And it's clearly now, I think, the most important thing. We've had the medal factory. We've had the massive investment and the medals come rolling in in successive Olympic and Paralympic sports. But I think now the focus on athlete welfare and particularly sharply in focus this week with Kadena Cox's comments there about the eating disorder, I think bodies like British Athletics and all the sporting bodies that are in receipt of, of public money have to be talking day in, day out to their athletes and making sure that, you know, they are fit both in, in mind and body. Because we focused a lot on, you know, would we send an athlete who had a niggly hamstring or a bit of a knock to a championship like this? You know, we now have to make decisions on whether people are mentally right to go to championships. And as I said, right at the start of this, 
We have to trust what British athletics and other bodies are doing uh, around safeguarding because that is a key focus at the moment. Just a final point I just want to really raise with you, John, and see what you think. Are we at the point now with Paralympic sport, and my suggestion would be I think that we are, that we need to kind of stop using phrases like inspiring and superhuman. That's been the narrative up to now. But now I think we have to accept athletes like Hannah Cockcroft, purely and simple, as an athlete, as a 12-time world champion, as someone that's won 20 international medals. And it's not necessarily about the backstory now. It's about the achievements and the huge achievements she's had on the track. Yeah, I think that I think that's a fair question, and, we, and we've talked about it before on on other pods of uh, anything but footy, where people have said, "Well, can you explain what the categories are?" And we're like, "Well, actually, the athletes don't really want us to. They want us to just say this is where they won and how they won." And 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 I think you're right, but I think insp- I, I think it would be wrong to say that they're still not inspiring, or we shouldn't say they're inspiring because I'm inspired by Andy Murray, who we'll talk about a bit later on in the pod for for coming back from injury after uh, you know after his hip surgery and. And I, I think you can still tell the story. And actually, I think that more athletes, and we'll be talking a lot about British athletics in in this uh, episode of Anything But Footy still to come, where, you know, actually you want to hear the stories behind them competing and, and how difficult it is to be a world-class sportsman in this day and age. Social media has changed things the way that, you know, you're, you're never off duty, if you like, uh, as well, and, and, and how you have to push and push to, to be the world's best because there are so many other people in the world who want to do what you want to do so i think we're right to tell the story of the of the hopefully paralympians next year the para athletes who've been in action in the last week or so we're right to tell the story but we're also right to say hannah cockcroft you're spot on michael is a world-class athlete and a world-class british athlete and is up there with the likes of Sir Andy Murray. And, and you know, those honours lists will be coming up uh, with the Queen's birthday in the next few weeks or so. You know, we really need to be looking and making sure that she's being recognised for that. Before we move on, 280 days before Tokyo 2020, those British uh, hope-to-be Paralympians will be taking a short break before focusing on Tokyo 2020. Japan were 13th in the table in Dubai, Michael, with three goals. So still quite some work to do ahead of next year with the the Paralympics in Japan. But I have a feeling, like we said with Brazil, that they were pretty much in the same position before Rio. Yeah, and also news from UK Athletics this week, of course. They've announced a new interim coaching structure as well. Neil Blatt, the performance director, parted company. Uh, If you're a regular listener to anything but footy, you may well already know that. He's parted company with the organisation. So they've now got an interim coaching structure. Briefly, six key positions. So Steve Paulding now leads the uh, coaching setup. He was previously part of British Cycling and the coaching setup there. He's assisted by Tommy Yule, who was part of Great Britain's weightlifting team and performance director there. He's now director of performance support. Paula Dunn, who we've heard from already on this podcast, she stays in place leading the Paralympic and the uh, Para-Athlete program. And then you've got three coaches below them. Stephen Maguire, who will be heading up the sprints, the hurdles, the relays. Uh, Barry Fudge who we spoke to, of course, on our night of the 10K PBs. He will be heading up the endurance athletes, and Peter Stanley will be heading up the field and combined events as well. You're listening to Anything But Footy, our Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast. Still to come, we will be talking about, potentially, the British Olympic Association being taken to court. That to come, but another event we've talked about in the last couple of podcasts, the World Athletics Athletes of the Year Awards in Monaco later this year. The final shortlists have been revealed, cutting both the men and women's shortlist down to five names each. World triple jump champion Yulimar Rohash of Venezuela is up for female athlete of the year and 200 metre champion Noel Isles is the men's award. Just a shame of course their events were dropped from the Diamond League uh, less than a week ago. Can you imagine the speeches when they win? With threats (laughs) of a boycott from athletes as discussed in last week's episode, Diamond League cull to the assembled great and good of the IAAF, which, as I said, has now been rebranded to World Athletics. And that awards evening is Saturday, November the 23rd. I can't wait for those speeches. Yeah, it might be a slightly uneasy night uh, for Sebastian Coe and John Ridgeon and others. I tell you what, 2022 is looking to be a pretty good year for the sport. 
sporting diary. Uh, you're going to have the Winter Olympics taking place, of course, in Beijing in 2022. Uh, you've got the Commonwealth Games taking place, of course, in Birmingham in 2022. There'll be major football tournaments, of course, taking place in 2022. Qatar will be hosting uh, the World Cup. And Berlin will now follow Glasgow in hosting the next edition of the European Championships. Dates for the diary. 11th to the 21st of August. So we'll dovetail nicely uh, from the Commonwealth Games. Sports that will be taking place in Berlin. Athletics, cycling, golf, gymnastics, rowing and triathlon. And the uh, people that run aquatics, basically swimming, water polo, uh, artistic swimming and diving. They have announced their European Championships will take place across the same dates. Although it now looks likely it will be in a separate city. So that follows the model of 2018 where Berlin, of course, hosts hosted the athletics but Glasgow got to host the rest of the sport so yes European Championships 11th to the 21st of August uh, taking place in the summer of 2022 I'm available Wow, uh, 2022, I can't believe all those events that you read out. That sounds an incredible year. Absolutely can't wait for that. And I think Andy Murray may well still be going because he continues his comeback from hip surgery. And now he's saying he could see himself beating Federer, Nadal and Djokovic again. The 32-year-old, now father of three after baby Teddy was born in October, won the European Open title last month in Antwerp, only his seventh singles tournament since January's hip surgery. And he now says he's excited to see what he can do do over the next couple of years incredible when he really was in tears uh, earlier on in the year and we all thought he'd retired starting with the davis cup the new look world cup type event this week in madrid uh, great britain face the netherlands on wednesday kazakhstan on thursday before the quarters semis and hopefully the final at the weekend so andy murray will continue and go on but one of british cycling's biggest names stephen burke announced his retirement this week, he won gold, you'll recall, as part of the men's pursuit squads that won the uh, top place in London in 2012 and Rio in 2016. He also has an individual pursuit bronze medal from Beijing. He will still compete domestically in some of the cycling six-day events and on the domestic circuit. But as far as British Cycling and Team GB is concerned, Stephen Burke has hung up his helmet. This is Anything But Footy, your Olympic and Paralympic podcast. Still to come, badminton, table tennis, swimming and curling. But we move on to one of the biggest stories, I think, for a very, very long time. 250 days to go before Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Great Britain and Northern Ireland, overseen by the British Olympic Association, Team GB, of course, as we know them are always one of the best prepared for the Olympics. They always have the best kit, the best travel out to the event, the best pre-games camps in Japan. They have three near Tokyo, the Kei University, the Todoroki Stadium and the Yokohama International Pool. But the British Olympic Association have another fight on its hands before the Games this year, whether some of its best-known athletes, including a world champion and medalists from the recent Doha World Athletics Championships, will be competing for Team GB. Katerina Johnson-Thompson, Laura Muir, Adam Jamili, and even Samo Farah are challenging the legality of the decision to stop athletes from promoting their own sponsors during the Olympics. And you'll remember Michael discussed this on episode 31 of Anything But Footy. The heat is on, it's called, but it's just got a lot hotter. Just to remind you, it's Rule 40 of the Olympic Charter which aim to protect the official Olympic sponsors from uh, hijacking uh, the sponsorship. And it's been relaxed after a campaign led by Germany and the USA. And Team GB announced that its British performers would be allowed to tweet their thanks to their sponsor during the Games. But apparently, this is not enough for Jamili and the like. Are you surprised by this, Michael? Um, I was surprised, to be honest, because I thought with the moves that Team GB had made... Um, that they were going in the right direction. Now, it doesn't surprise me that the athletes and some of those that you name, Adam Jamili, Laura Muir, Katrina Johnson-Thompson and Mo Farah, um, want this to go further or want the relaxation to go further. And actually, of those names that, that we mentioned, they are probably four or five that probably need this the least, if you if you understand what I mean by that. Because, you know, by Mo Farah not being able to, to tweet a thank you to some personal sponsors probably won't economically 
um, have a massive difference to Mo Farah. Financially, he's probably pretty secure, along with, you know, some of the other names that I mentioned there. You know, they're quite high profile. They've probably got some decent deals. What the rule, I think, really does affect is some of those much lesser high profile athletes you know the ones that have got little deals going with some of those local companies local organizations those people that are backing them for three years and 50 weeks uh, outside of, of the two weeks of the olympics and then suddenly have to be discarded to one side so what i'm surprised about is that this has gone public so quickly i would have presumed with someone like adam jamili who's on the boa athletes commission that this might have been a discussion that had gone on in-house a little bit more. Um, I'm surprised that it was aired so publicly this week. But clearly, the reason that that has happened is because the athletes are not happy and whether they feel, and they probably have been having behind closed doors discussions, that they aren't going further enough, far enough. And it has to be, I guess, the likes of Katarina Johnson-Thompson, Adam Jamili, Mo Farah, Laura Muir, the high-profile ones, that are going in to bat, if you like, for some of those lesser-profile names that... You know, we might not even have heard of now that we'll will massively lose out by not being able um, to work with their their local and their year round sponsors. I said in the pod a couple of weeks ago that, you know, I thought it was a good idea that Team GB had relaxed the rules, especially with social media for the smaller sponsors, like you absolutely said. But unlike world champions, Johnson Thompson, Mo Farah, who, who didn't need help with profile and I. My issue with this slightly is that, you know, and I've got huge respect for British athletics team and, you know, and, and, and enjoy meeting them and, uh, and, and interviewing them. And I think they work really, really hard for what they want to achieve. But it feels a bit like a slightly few privileged people are moaning. You know, apart from Mo Farah, none of these people have won an Olympic gold medal. So why are they worrying about this 250 days before the Games? Why are they not focusing on trying to be an Olympic champion? and then bring up the sponsorship stuff afterwards. For me, it's a distraction to what they should be what they should be doing. And also, I think it's a bit of a kick in the teeth for, for Team GB. I yes, mentioned earlier... I do too. About, you know, I mentioned earlier about how much preparation these, these go in. And, and these are not funded by the government. The British Olympic Association is a, is a standalone operation. It's not UK sport. It's not lottery funded. It's not for money from the government. It has to raise £60 million from sponsors. And, you know, that is not easy. Um, they have the best kit, the best travel, accommodation, logistical, medical, training support. We talked about safeguarding earlier on in the pod, and, and they've looked at that after, uh, after some questions at Rio. And if you're Adidas, Aldi, Deloitte, Haven and DFS, and you've paid money for the British Olympic Association sponsorship, then you want, you want value for money, don't you? Yeah, I, I actually hadn't really considered some of the points that you raised there. I was going to say that I totally understand where the BOA, the British Olympic Association, are coming from in that they've got some landmark sponsors. And you make the point quite correctly that, that if you hadn't, I would have, which is, you know, they're not government funded. They don't get money automatically. They have to go out and raise this money. And that is a huge job for them. And it's especially a big job for the British Olympic Association to raise that money when the focus isn't on Olympic sports. And, and that is more often than not, which is one of the reasons why we do this podcast, Anything But Footy. Because, you know, for so many people, the Olympics is, is two, three weeks every four years. And yet if you're head of commercial, head of sponsorship, head of media, whatever, at the BOA, you need to keep that drum drumming for the other three years and 50 odd weeks and you need to keep the money coming in you know it's not a big fat organization they don't have you know oodles and oodles of staff across many many floors in a big flash central london hq yes they are based in london but we've both been to the hq you know they've got a a, a slim staff there and they're working incredibly hard ensuring that our athletes are going to games winter and summer and european games and youth olympics to be as prepared as they possibly could for all those things that you mention and then it does stick in the throat a little bit i guess for some people if if mo farah who probably is in receipt of you know six four figure sums whatever for endorsements saying you know he wants a little bit more during games time the only thing to counter that is to go back to that point i originally made 
are the big names, the likes of Farrow, Katarina Johnson, Thompson, going into bat for some of those other names that perhaps don't carry the same kind of weight with the general Brit- British public? That would be the only other thing I would suggest. Yeah, I think, you know, Jamelia said, I've had a lot of athletes get in touch. Uh, he said this in the mail this week. There were a lot of athletes interested in what we are doing. But all I can see is who's liked it and retweeted it or whatever on social media. It's kind of the athletics fraternity. And that's and that's fine. And, you know, I don't have an issue with raising question marks over it. I have an issue saying we want to take you to court, to be brutally honest, because I don't think that's part of negotiation. That's not the, you know, and maybe it's just the, the, the way that the headlines are written. But you kind of have to throw that at the last resort. It shouldn't be the first thing that, that, that you're talking about. And I just haven't seen a number of the other smaller sports who fight tooth and nail to get the, to the Olympics and then benefit from the amazing preparation that Team GB give them and how much support they give them. I haven't seen other athletes moaning about this. And as you know, we said it in the podcast a couple of weeks ago and you went through all the details. They have relaxed the rules. They've looked at what Germany have done. They've looked at the USA. They've said they've looked at what the Olympics has done and they've looked at their own funding and said this is the best way that we can make this work as well as the giving athletes something to be able to thank the smaller sponsors. Just one final point on that before we move on. I remember in the build-up to Rio speaking to a British sprinter, Louise Bleur, from from Rotherham, and she was selected as as part of the relay team. She didn't actually get to race in Rio, but she was part of the, the bigger relay team, and I was interviewing her. And her full-time job is as a nutritionist, and she's worked, I think, with the judokas and taekwondo, uh, definitely the divers as well. And so she's been to Olympics as part of the staff before, but this was uh, as a sprinter selected as, as part of the team. And I remember her telling me, she says, they really, really look after you. I mean, I've had good experiences going to the Olympics before as part of the staff, but, you know, to go as a member of the team as one of the athletes, they really, really do look after you. And, and that kind of, stuck with me and I think that's probably you know the point that that John was making there about the preparation and all the all the assistance that those athletes who will be going to Tokyo will get from Team GB you're listening to anything but footy the Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast talking of a uh, slim staff and low cost that's us but we would love your support as we're on track to Tokyo in 2020 and we do now as uh, we've said right at the start of the podcast have over 1,000 downloads a month in fact in the last week we're nearly up to 600 downloads and if you would like to be part of our success and like to share all these athletes both para athletes and olympic athletes their journey uh, to tokyo in 2020 on the podcast anything but footy we do now have some commercial opportunities for you what i mean by that is sponsorship opportunities or commercial partnerships please do get in touch with us through our website anythingbutfooty.com or drop us an email anythingbutfooty at gmail.com let's round up just a little bit more of the week's news now great week for england's para badminton players daniel bethel won the japan international title beating the world number one from india in the final a decent week too for our para fencers piers gulliver won gold in amsterdam at the start of the new world cup season uh, gb's dimitri kucha won two golds adding the epa and the Goal, adding the Epe gold to the foil gold that he won earlier in the week. And remember uh, the fencing, para fencing European Championships being held in Great Britain next year. In table tennis, Liam Pitchford says he can reflect on a good couple of tournaments after reaching the last 16 of the Austrian Open this week. He beat Juan Mitsutani of Japan in the Austrian Open in the latest World Tour competition, who also won shot of the day during that victory. And it's well worth a look on Twitter. I highly recommend it. Um, Pitchford eventually losing to German Timo Boll. And the International Swimming League finally splashes down. See what I did there? In London next week, uh, teams will take part across two days. The Aqua Centurions, Energy Standard and Iron Team will be joined by the London Raw, which features James Guy, Adam Peaty, Duncan Scott and Siobhan Marie O'Connor. They are all set to compete in London at the Aquatic Centre, all part of the International Swimming League. I'm looking forward to seeing it up close and personal when it touches down in our capital city. 
And a perfect start to the European Curling Championships as well. Two wins from two for Scotland or GB, uh, whichever one you want to support, with Team Patterson beating Norway 10-4 and Italy 7-5. And Team Muirhead also got off to a winning start by overcoming Norway 7-4. And from the cool of curling, a reminder that we have been talking hot stuff with British athletics in the last few minutes on the podcast. If you disagree with us, then please do get in touch because we'd love to hear from you. And we've had British athletes on telling us how they feel about subjects and topics. So if you think that it is right that the British Olympic Association are wrong about sponsorship, then get in touch at anything but F on Twitter or message us on Insta and Facebook as we continue our countdown to Tokyo 2020.